This lecture is about the Battle of Milne Bay, the first time in the war that the Japanese are defeated in a land battle. One Australian pilot once said of Milne Bay, if you're going to give the world an enema, you'd push it in at Milne Bay. This is a map of the Pacific Theater of Operation. This is part of the sub-theater in the Southwest Pacific Theater. This is the area of interest in the Southwest Pacific Theater of Operation. This is a map of New Guinea. This is the Papuan Peninsula. This is the Papuan Peninsula at the eastern end of New Guinea. Milne Bay is located at the easternmost end of the peninsula. This was the strategic situation in the Southwest Pacific Theater at the beginning of August 1942. Japan occupied the entire north coast of New Guinea, the islands of the Bismarck Archipelago, including their large base at Rabaul, and had begun building an airstrip in the southern Solomons at Guadalcanal. The American 1st Marine Division would invade Guadalcanal and Tulagi on August 7th and begin a six-month battle that would eventually eject the Japanese from the Lower Solomons. Although a strategic loss to the Japanese in May 1942, the Battle of the Coral Sea demonstrated the strategic importance of Milne Bay at the eastern tip of New Guinea. The Japanese loss at Coral Sea convinced them that a base located at Milne Bay would be invaluable for the air support of any future convoy rounding the eastern tip of Papua to threaten Port Moresby. A base at the head of Milne Bay would bring their bombers within an hour's striking distance of Port Moresby. The planned assault from the east would not be undertaken in isolation, but as the second of a two-pronged thrust. The first would arrive from the north along a bush track from the coast over the Owen Stanley Mountains and to the very back door of Port Moresby. This track passed close to a small airstrip at a village called Kokoda. Acquisition of the airfields at Port Moresby and Milne Bay would enable the Japanese to bomb northern Australia, harass the shipping lanes from the United States, and protect their right flank. By this stage of the war, the Japanese Imperial Army had conquered all in its path, virtually unchallenged. What it wanted, it took, and at relatively little cost. They had developed what later was termed victory disease. They thought themselves invincible. This attitude informed their strategy and seemingly insatiable appetite for more territory. This attitude would prove fatal in both New Guinea and Guadalcanal. General MacArthur was equally aware of the strategic importance of Milne Bay and he knew of its importance to the Japanese. The Owen Stanley Range was equally a barrier to advance to both the Allies and the Japanese. An Allied base at Milne Bay would pave the way for a move around the eastern end of the Papuan Peninsula and along the Papuan coast to Buna and on to the main objectives of Lee and Salamaua, avoiding the mountains. Milne Bay in Allied hands would anchor the eastern flank of Port Moresby. Accordingly, the Allies began to construct a secret air, land, and sea base at Gilly Gilly at the head of Milne Bay. Operation Fall River was so secret that the initial execution of the plant went undetected by the Japanese. Just as the Japanese beat the Allies to Buna, the Allies beat Japan to Milne Bay. An Allied garrison consisting of 7,500 Australians and 1,300 American engineers arrived at Milne Bay on June 25, 1942. The American engineers began construction of the first of three airfields near the Gilly Gilly Lever Brothers Coconut Plantation. This was the Milne Force Order of Battle. Notice that there are two 9th Battalions. The 9th Battalion of the 18th Brigade's shoulder patch has a gray border around it. The shoulder patch of the 9th Battalion of the 7th Brigade's militia does not have the gray border. The designation AIF stands for Australian Imperial Force. 
When Australia raised battalions in World War II that had previously existed in World War I, they put a two in front of AIF. The 18th Brigade was composed of three battalions of veteran soldiers of the 2nd AIF recently returned from combat in North Africa. These were some of Australia's best infantry. The base at Milne Bay was garrisoned by Australian militia of the 7th Infantry Brigade. The garrison was further reinforced by the 2nd AIF troops of the 18th Brigade of the 7th Division, newly arrived from the Middle East. Major General Cyril Close commanded Milne Force. He was a quiet but brilliant warrior having served in the Australian Army for 40 years spanning two world wars. He has been described as learned, cautious, and taciturn. The Japanese Special Naval Landing Force, SNLF, was not a marine force but was instead sailors who had basic infantry training. Like all landing forces, they often experienced heavy casualties when faced with determined resistance, as they did at Milne Bay. This was due to their poor training and unwillingness to surrender, and when completely out of ammunition, they sometimes resorted to hand-to-hand -hand fighting with their swords and bayonets. After the defeats at Guadalcanal and New Guinea, the SNLF was no longer used as an offensive force. By then, the Japanese were on the defensive for the rest of the war. Here is a map of the eastern tip of the Papuan Peninsula and Milne Bay. At the head of the bay, located at Gili Gili, was the home of the Lever Brothers Coconut Plantation, the largest in the world. Gili Gili was the site where the first of three airfields were to be built. This is a map of the head of Milne Bay with the three newly constructed airstrips near the Lever Brothers Coconut Plantation at Gili Gili. The head of the bay is about 12 kilometers wide and is deep enough to accommodate naval vessels. Here is a photo from 1942 showing the head of the bay and the Gili Gili Lever Brothers Coconut Plantation. There is a dirt road running along the northern coast of the bay called Government Track. Mangrove bushes hug the coast. This is a 1942 photo showing airstrips number one and number three and the town of Gili Gili. The decisive part of the battle took place at airstrip number three. The use of the airfields at Milne Bay demonstrated the utility of and tactical use of air power. This was the principle of moving land-based bombers forward along the axis of advance. One, advancing in successive leaps. Two, establishing forward airfields. And three, making the next move forward under the cover of the newly established air umbrella to take the next airfield. This is important because this is exactly the strategy that the Allies would use against the Japanese along the northern coast of New Guinea and in the Solomons in 1943. The Australians did most of the fighting at Milne Bay. United States engineers built the airstrips. Used for the first time at Milne Bay, one of the most important contributions was Martson matting, prefabricated metal runways. These allowed airstrips to be laid down almost anywhere. They were of particular help at Milne Bay because of the ubiquitous muddy conditions due to near constant rainfall. Today, Marston matting can be found all over the Pacific where it is used for housing and fences. Here is some Marston matting used for the walls of the World War II morgue at Guadalcanal. Squadron 75 and 76 of P-40 Kitty Hawk fighters were stationed at airstrip number 1 near Gilly Gilly on July 22nd. Once airstrip number 1 was operational, construction of two more airstrips was begun. Note the muddy conditions on the runway. This was a constant problem for the Kitty Hawks that led to occasional crashes. Mud was also a problem for the infantry. Here are Australian militia of the 61st Battalion on patrol on the muddy coastal government track. Here are some Australian infantry crossing a bridge over one of the many creeks and rivers at Milne Bay. This was the Japanese plan of attack. 
During the second week of August, Japanese air reconnaissance discovered Allied presence at Milne Bay. They immediately appreciated this as a clear threat to their plan for another seaborne attempt to take Port Moresby. They wanted a seaplane base at Milne Bay to protect their left flank of the ongoing battle in New Guinea along the Kokoda Track. They estimated the Allied strength believing there to be only two Australian companies, about three to six hundred men. The main invasion force consisted of only 1,250 Special Naval Landing Force troops. This force would land on the northern coast of Milne Bay. At the same time, an advance force of 350 Special Naval Landing Force troops would sail from Buna on August 24th to land on the northern coast of the peninsula at Tapota after an overnight bivouac on Good Enough Island at Galawai Bay. From there they would march overland seven miles as part of a pincer movement with the main invasion force coming from the east. Hugging the coast, the advance force was spotted by Australian coast watchers who radioed this information to Brisbane. This was the plan, but it did not quite work out this way. In addition to infantry, the Japanese would have the benefit of two light tanks. The Japanese army was to contribute the Kawaguchi detachment to the battle, but the tactical situation on Guadalcanal necessitated that it be diverted from the Milne Bay operation to Guadalcanal, where it was all but annihilated in the Battle of Bloody Ridge in mid-September. This diverted detachment was not replaced. The Battle of Milne Bay would be an exclusive Imperial Navy show. The Imperial Japanese Navy Command at Rabaul called for the launch of the Milne Bay operation immediately upon the expected recapture of Henderson Field on Guadalcanal by Colonel Ichiki. This first attempt to retake the airfield at Guadalcanal was a dismal failure for the Japanese. The entire Ichiki detachment, a battalion, was wiped out. Despite this loss, the Japanese were still confident that Guadalcanal would be retaken soon, the order to go ahead with the Milne Bay operation was given without waiting the outcome at Guadalcanal. The main point here is to illustrate that the two battles, the ongoing battle on the Papuan Peninsula and in the Solomons on Guadalcanal, were interdependent. The Japanese northern pincer force would stage from Good Enough Island at Galawa Bay on August 24th. This is a Japanese Daihatsu landing barge. The advance force was transported from Buna in seven of these barges. On August 25th, a little flotilla of seven landing barges decided to land on Good Enough Island to rest and to eat before continuing to Tapota. They went ashore at Galawa Bay on the southern coast of the island. Having been alerted to this threat by coast watchers, Ten Kitty Hawk fighters took off from airstrip number one and strafed the beachhead for two hours without opposition. All seven barges, fully laden with equipment and ammunition, were shredded and eight Japanese were killed. The northern arm of the planned pincer never made it to Tapota. They were marooned and without a radio. They would be dealt with later. This is an American Curtis P-40 Kitty Hawk with Australian roundel markings. Here is an Australian echelon of P-40s. This was the disposition of the Allies prior to the Battle of Milne Bay. The main concentration of Milne Force was located just west of Airstrip No. 3 near Gilly Gilly. This consisted of the 7th Brigade and two companies of the 61st Battalion. The 18th Brigade was held in reserve for the counterattack. Company D of the 61st Battalion was positioned at Ahoma. Further east was the 16th and 17th Platoons of D Company at East Cape, there to patrol and investigate suspicious lights and a rumor that there was a Japanese spy there. There was a platoon stationed at Tapota. Allied intelligence suggested that the Japanese would attempt to land there, which was the Japanese plan, although it never took place, as we have seen. Company B was positioned at the KB mission. Additionally, there was an American engineering company stationed near Airstrip 3. 
Early in the day of August 25th, General Claus decided to shorten his lines and ordered the platoons of D Company to withdraw behind B Company at KB Mission and reposition itself at the number 3 airstrip at Gilly Gilly. Three civilian boats were quickly commandeered, including the two-masted lugger Bronzewing, a boat previously owned by the Tasmanian-born actor Earl Flynn, who sailed it to Milne Bay before the war. Earlier, the Bronzewing had retrieved a downed pilot of a crashed Kitty Hawk from Goodenough Island. The three-boat flotilla also included Elavella and Datose. The Elavella departed Gilly Gilly to retrieve the men of the 16th and 17th platoons at East Cape. The men were in poor condition, suffering from malaria and exhaustion. The limited shipping space meant that only the men too sick to walk were placed aboard the boats. The rest had to make it to Gilly Gilly on foot. During the loading, a sergeant noticed some strange silhouettes on the horizon, but was told to forget about them. Earlier, the Royal Australian Air Force patrolling the mouth of the bay had already identified the suspicious shapes as Japanese ships racing toward Gilly Gilly. The Milne Bay Invasion Convoy entered the bay on August 25th, carrying 811 Special Naval Landing Force troops under the command of Commander Hayashi. The main Japanese force planned to land at Rabi, just a couple of kilometers from their target, Airfield Number 3. Because of the darkness, they made a navigational air and landed instead near Wagga Wagga, nine kilometers east of where they had intended, placing them even further from their objective. They also landed two Type 95 light tanks. Here is a photo of a captured Japanese Daihatsu landing barge. Just after midnight, the Elavella and the Bronzewing sailing west toward Gilly Gilly unknowingly sailed straight into the line of Japanese landing barges. In the ensuing firefight, Elavella was forced to beach and its occupants had to take to the jungle on foot, eventually reaching Gilly Gilly much later. The soldiers of Bronzewing did not fare as well. They put up a fight, but of the 22 soldiers aboard, 11 were killed in the firefight, drowned, or were captured and later executed. The other 11 managed to swim to shore and eventually made it back to Gilly Gilly. Company B of the 61st Battalion was dug in at KB Mission under the command of Captain Charles Bix. When he received news that the Japanese had landed to the east of Wagga Wagga, he ordered 14 men of the 11th Platoon under the command of Lieutenant Herbert Robinson to move three kilometers further east of the mission. Robinson could hear the sounds of the firefight in the direction of Ahoma, where the Bronzewing drama was playing out. He knew that the Japanese were between him and the survivors of D Company. He was worried about firing at his own men, advancing in the same direction as the Japanese. Robinson placed Private Walter Witten with a Bren gun in a forward position as a lookout. At 1 a.m., Witten heard rustling as four shadowy figures approached him along the road. The inexperienced digger stood up and commanded, Halt! Who goes there? There was no answer but a short pause before the Japanese opened fire, killing Witten. Behind him, the rest of his platoon opened fire on the Japanese, killing all four. Lieutenant Robinson then placed his men on both sides of the road in ambush and waited for the Japanese to approach. Twenty minutes later, about a hundred Japanese appeared on the road passing the dead bodies of their four comrades without stopping to investigate. Robinson ordered fire. Both Bren guns opened fire into the mass of Japanese, killing several and scattering the rest into the jungle. The Japanese tried to flank Robinson's position from both the jungle and from the water. Robinson quickly realized what they were doing and ordered his men to pull back about 200 yards toward KB Mission and form a defensive line. At 2 a.m. on August 26th, Robinson heard the grinding of metallic tracks of an approaching tank. As it approached, the tank began firing a machine gun into the jungle on each side of the government track. This was the first of two Japanese Type 95 Hago light infantry tanks. 
Advancing behind the tank's powerful searchlight was Japanese infantry walking four abreast. The tank would move ahead, firing its 7.7mm machine gun to clear a path, stop, or even back up as the infantry would move forward to occupy the fire-swept ground. Robinson's men opened up with their automatic weapons. The tank fired blindly into the dark, then paused. During this pause, Robinson took the opportunity to pull back. This pattern was repeated all night. Every few hundred meters, make a stand, fire at the advancing Japanese, then fall back to another line. After the tank cleared the track, Japanese infantry moved forward. This is the Type 95 Japanese light tank. It had a 37mm main gun and two 7.7mm machine guns. The Japanese never developed a heavy tank. The Sherman tank had five times the armor as the Japanese tank and a larger main gun, 75mm. Here is a Type 95 tank with camouflage. One of the Japanese tanks approached a bridge over the river just east of the mission. Lieutenant Robinson hid in some brush and waited for the Japanese to appear. As the tank prepared to cross the narrow bridge, the tank driver raised his head out of the turret to negotiate the bridge. From 150 yards, Robinson raised his rifle and placed the exposed tank driver in his gun sights and fired. His shot hit the tank driver in the head, killing him instantly. The tank lurched off the bridge and landed nose down in the mud below. Robinson's markmanship would hold up the Japanese advance, but not for long. The Japanese were able to eventually extricate the tank. Here are some weary pilots of the 75th Squadron heading to their planes, walking on marts and matting. This is airstrip number one in the middle of nowhere. It was later named Gurney Field in memory of Australian aviation hero Charles Gurney. Squadron leader Gurney was killed while on a bombing mission over Rabaul on May 2, 1942. He was awarded the Air Force Cross. Here is an Australian 40mm anti-aircraft position near one of the airfields. Note the muddy airstrip with the P-40 Kitty Hawk taking off. The morning after the Japanese landings, 14 Royal Australian Air Force Kitty Hawk fighters and Hudson bombers suddenly attacked the beachhead, destroying a large cache of supplies. When they ran out of ammunition, they returned to the airfields nearby at Gilly Gilly, refueled and rearmed, and took off again to continue the attacks against the undefended Japanese barges and supplies. The loss of these supplies and the barges was a major setback for the Japanese. At Wagga Wagga, the Japanese first employed what would become a feature of their attack at Milne Bay, using English to throw doubt among the diggers. Many of the Japanese could speak passable English. During the early stages of the battle when the Japanese morale was high, they used phrases like, take it easy, don't fire, pull back, to unnerve the Australian soldiers or to lead them astray. Usually, the peculiar context gave the Japanese away, such as, keep to the middle of the road, or good morning, when it was obviously the middle of the afternoon. After two days of fighting and delaying tactics by the militia of the 61st Battalion, the 2nd AIF 10th Battalion was committed to the battle. They moved from Gilly Gilly with only light weapons. They did not have any anti-tank weapon. The 425 men of the battalion formed a cordon perimeter defense around the KB mission on the afternoon of August 27th. Early in the evening, two Japanese tanks emerged from the jungle with a spotlight showing the way. The two tanks crossed the creek and moved toward B Company. Japanese infantry followed behind the tanks. The tanks fought in tandem, firing at the Australians with their machine guns. The main gun was not effective at dispersed infantry, but the machine guns tore up the Australians and the Japanese infantry moved forward. The Australians tried to stop the tanks with sticky bombs, but they failed to stick or did not detonate. In any event, the tanks kept rolling and firing. 
the Australian defense was completely overrun by the tanks. The fighting deteriorated to hand-to-hand -hand fighting. By 11 p.m., the situation for B Company was grim. They were overwhelmed by the infantry tank tactics. The 2nd 10th Battalion was ordered to retreat to a new defensive position to the west of Modio Creek. The battle for KB Mission was an Australian disaster. The failure to hold their positions can be blamed mostly on senior command and lack of intelligence as to the Japanese strength and for lack of an effective anti-tank weapon. The Australians suffered 43 KIA and 26 wounded. The Japanese, using the previously successful infantry tank tactics, continued to push the 2nd 10th Battalion back toward airstrip number 3. The 25th Battalion was brought forward to tie in with the 61st Battalion, both militia battalions, mainly deployed on the southern side of airstrip number 3 with part of the 61st Battalion deployed along Stevens Ridge to the north. The airstrip proved to be a perfect defensive position, offering a wide field of fire, and its eastern end thick with mud would serve to prevent the movement of tanks. Airstrip number 3 was the ultimate Japanese objective. At dawn on August 28th, the Japanese reached the airstrip and attacked behind a barrage of mortars and small caliber artillery. The two tanks were conspicuous by their absence. From the southern edge of the airstrip, the 25th and 61st Battalions and the American 709th Anti-Aircraft Battery turned back the Japanese infantry with machine guns, mortars, and strafing runs by P-40s. No doubt the Japanese missed the tanks. The Japanese were forced to fall back two kilometers to the east of Rabi. A Japanese convoy arrived off Wagga Wagga farther to the east in the evening of August 29th and disgorged reinforcements. They launched another attack against the airstrip and were again beaten back with heavy casualties, including their commanding officer, Commander Hayashi. The assault force was left in disarray. The Battle of Number 3 Airstrip was the turning point in the battle for Milne Bay. In a single night, the Japanese, through persistent, unimaginative tactics, squandered a large number of the combat troops they had landed at Milne Bay. Commander Hayashi and his entire headquarters staff were dead. The remaining Japanese troops were demoralized and in poor physical condition. The defeat scattered the Japanese combat elements and made it difficult for the few surviving Japanese officers to maintain discipline and reconstitute their broken units. Following the battle at airstrip number 3 and the Japanese withdrawal, the 2nd 12th Battalion pursued the Japanese to KB Mission. The 2nd 9th was transported to KB Mission by boat. By September 2nd, the 2nd 9th was firmly entrenched at the mission. By now, the Japanese were in a pathetic state, their hopes of reversing the defeats at the airstrip diminished by the day. As the Australians advanced east to pursue the retreating Japanese, they came upon dozens of apparently dead Japanese soldiers. Most were dead, but as at Guadalcanal, some only feigned death. To lure unsuspecting soldiers close enough to jump up and shoot, or, more likely, to detonate a grenade. Like the Americans at Guadalcanal, the Australians learned their lesson the hard way and soon began bayoneting and shooting every body they encountered, not willing to take a chance. It was unofficially decreed that no enemy would be considered dead unless he had been killed several times over by passing Australians, usually by means of the bayonet. This Japanese ploy of plain dogo assaulted the sensibilities of both the Australians and the Americans who used the tactic of repeatedly killing apparently dead Japanese soldiers throughout the Pacific War. During the period of September 3rd through 5th, the 2nd 9th fought it out with the Japanese having taken over the main responsibilities from 2nd 12th of destroying the Japanese. They pushed them further and further back from Wagga Wagga, the same spot where they came ashore on August 25th. The Japanese radio that they needed to be evacuated. This began on September 4th, and by September 5th, the evacuation had been completed except for a few stragglers who were eventually hunted down and killed. The Australians took only one prisoner. What was left of the Japanese were evacuated to Rabaul. 
The only Victoria Cross for action at Milne Bay was awarded to Corporal John French, who took it upon himself to silence a menacing Japanese machine gun position. French told his section to take cover while he advanced towards the first machine gun position. Single-handedly, he moved against the position, firing a Thompson submachine gun from the hip, destroying the position. Using grenades, he silenced a second machine gun position. He approached a third position and silenced it with the Thompson. His comrade watched all of this and saw him get hit in the chest. Despite these wounds, he continued to advance against the Japanese, firing all the way. When the firefight ended, his section crept forward and found French dead on the cusp of the third machine gun position. The three Japanese at the gun were dead. French was posthumously awarded the VC. What happened to the two Japanese tanks? The tanks were located abandoned 200 yards west of the Gamma River. They were found stuck in the mud off to the side of government track. To make them inoperable, the tracks were blown off. I would now like to provide a brief analysis of the Battle of Milne Bay. What were the factors that led to the Allied victory at Milne Bay? The Allies did a good job of concealing the base from the Japanese. The Allies held a 4-1 to one numerical advantage in men. A crucial advantage held by the Allies was air support. The Japanese were promised air support, but never got it. The heavy losses of fighter aircraft at Guadalcanal depleted the number of available Japanese planes to support the Rabe operation, effectively ceding control of the skies to the Allies. The Allies used their air superiority to destroy supplies and landing barges both at Good Enough Island and at Milne Bay. The loss of the barges at Good Enough deprived the Japanese of the northern pincer force. Allied control of the skies during the day forced the Japanese to restrict their movement to the hours of darkness. Despite the Japanese use of tanks, the Allies had superior infantry weapons and had better trained infantry. They had better small arms and better hand grenades. The Australians had the Bren submachine gun. The Japanese had no equivalent to match it. The best weapon the Japanese had was the light tank. This would have been less effective had the Australians had an anti-tank weapon when they needed it during the Battle of KB mission. The overall training of the Australians and military preparedness was better than that of the sailors of the Japanese Special Naval Landing Force. Why were the Japanese defeated at Milne Bay? The Japanese woefully lacked intelligence that shaped their planning. Accurate intelligence could have provided the Japanese with a battlefield multiplier to compensate for the Allied advantages in training and weapons. This lack of intelligence condemned the Rabe operation before it even began. The strength of the Allied garrison at Milne Bay was unknown but presumed to be small. The actual strength of the Allied garrison was almost 10,000. That the Japanese launched this operation without having clear estimate of the Allied strength defies belief. Accordingly, the Japanese plans were overly ambitious and nowhere near enough combat troops to complete the allocated tasks. They were also woefully ignorant of the terrain and climate at Milne Bay. They did not reconnoiter the battlefield prior to the invasion and their maps were rudimentary and aerial photographs were scarce. These inadequacies contributed to the Japanese landing at the wrong place miles from their target at airstrip number 3. This deprived them of the element of surprise. The Japanese were led by substandard leadership of their commanders. General Hayashi had the demeanor of a man resigned to defeat. The less experienced IJN troops attacked frontally rather than trying to flank Australian positions. This made it easier for the Australians to repulse these attacks. In contrast, the IJA along the Kokoda track routinely used flanking maneuvers to attack Australian positions from the side and sometimes from the rear to great success. The main reason the Japanese failed at Milne Bay was because they overstretched their resources by attempting to conduct three offensive operations at the same time. A common theory to explain this is the concept of victory disease, a phrase coined to explain the hubris that corrupted the Japanese war strategy. 
Once the war started, the Japanese became intoxicated by success and developed a near pathologic belief that imperial toughness would compensate the shortfalls in material and manpower. The three concurrently running battles at Kokoda, Milne Bay, and Guadalcanal stretched the available Japanese resources to the point where they could not support all three at the same time. All three battles influenced the other two. Guadalcanal was the most important of the three operations simply because the Japanese chose to make it so. They decided to invest the majority of their resources at Guadalcanal at the expense of the Kokoda and Milne Bay operations. As the tactical situation deteriorated at Guadalcanal, resources destined for Milne Bay and Kokoda were diverted to Guadalcanal. In the end, the Japanese lost all three battles. Kokoda vs. Milne Bay Operation Comparison Both the Kokoda and Milne Bay operations were fought with the same objective of preventing the Japanese from attacking and occupying Port Moresby. The Kokoda campaign lasted three months over a geographic area of 100 square kilometers of jungle. The Milne Bay operation lasted just two weeks and was fought in a confined area near the head of the bay and its north shore. At Milne Bay, Japanese forces consisted of entirely inexperienced IJN units and overall poorer quality than the IJA units. The terrain at Milne Bay allowed the P-40 fighters to be based close to the battlefield and provide rapid air support for ground operations. The fighters along the Kokoda track had no such air support except for airdrop of supplies. Kokoda was exclusively an infantry operation. At Milne Bay, the infantry battalion carried a large burden of the fighting but was complemented to a substantial degree by supporting arms including artillery and engineers. The United States engineers also played a combat role at airstrip number three and also built the airstrips. Kokoda versus Milne Bay operation, a relative importance comparison. One argument goes, strategically the Kokoda campaign was relatively unimportant compared to the Milne Bay operation. Possession of the trail was not essential. The only part of the trail of any importance was the airstrip at Kokoda, not the trail itself. Allied control of the airstrip enabled supplies to be flown to Kokoda and then fed forward to the really important part of the Papuan campaign, the bridgeheads of Buna, Gona, and Sanananda. As soon as the Papuan campaign was concluded, the Kokoda airstrip lost its importance. In comparison, the prize fought over at Melon Bay was the base itself. Following the battle, Milne Bay became one of the busiest air bases and ports in the southwest Pacific area, remaining that way for much of the remainder of the war and serving as a staging base for Allied troops passing through to other battlefronts. By this measure, Milne Bay was far more important than the Kokoda track. A contrary argument can be made that Kokoda was more important than because capturing Port Moresby was the Japanese objective in both campaigns, but in the case of Kokoda, it was the direct objective, whereas at Milne Bay, the airstrips were the direct objective, with an assault on Port Moresby predicated on their capture. It is believed by some that Kokoda was more important, reasoning that the Allies needed Kokoda in order to capture Buna and thereby eject the Japanese from Papua. Regardless, both Milne Bay and Kokoda were subordinate to the all-important battle on the northern coast of the Papuan Peninsula at Buna, Gona, and Sanananda. It was necessary to control this part of the Papuan Peninsula before the next phase of the battle, retaking Lea and Salamaua and the rest of New Guinea. The Butcher's Bill the Australians suffered 161 KIA or MIA and 212 wounded out of approximately 9,000 troops. The Americans suffered 14 KIA. The Japanese suffered between 650 and 750 KIA and approximately 1,300 evacuated out of 2,800 troops. This political cartoon appeared in the Brisbane Courier Mail on September 2, 1942. This is the strategic situation at the end of January 1943. The Japanese had been cleared out of the Papuan Peninsula. They still controlled the northern coast of New Guinea, 
most of the northern Solomons, the Bismarck Archipelago and the seas around them, and the Japanese still had their air and naval base intact at Rabaul. The Allies were in firm control of the Papuan Peninsula and Guadalcanal. The threat to Australia had been removed, but it had taken six months of dirty combat. Allied plans for the next phase of Operation Cartwheel, the reduction of Rabaul, was to boot the Japanese out of Lea and the Huon Peninsula by the Americans and the Australians under the command of General MacArthur and to boot the Japanese out of Munda on the island of New Georgia, primarily by the U.S. Army and United States Marines under the command of Admiral William Halsey. Thus ended the crucial battle for control of Milne Bay, the first time the Japanese had been defeated in a land battle in World War II. The Allied victory here would pave the way for the continued advance of the Allies along the northern coast of New Guinea. Ultimate victory in New Guinea started here at Milne Bay.